Right now on the phone is my first guest of the day. This is State Senator Rob Sampson. Senator Sampson, welcome back to Talk of the Town. Thanks for having me, Steve. Appreciate you always joining me here. Uh, there was a story in the paper in the Rep Ham today about, uh, and we've got a couple of topics that we'll touch on, but the first one is this, uh, uh, this aid to illegal immigrants that has been proposed by the governor in, uh, here in Connecticut. And uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Right. Yeah, no, I, I became aware of this yesterday, Steve, and um, I was surprised by it, um, although I shouldn't be. Uh, you know, I think we have a, a, a series of bad policy decisions being made uh, in our state government uh, over the long term. And certainly uh, in the, the recent uh, month or so, um, kind of as the as the governor has been left to his own devices, um, he seems to be moving less and less um, uh, forward on. Uh, issues concerning public health and more towards, you know, political agenda items of the Democrats. And th- this really surprised me because, I mean, it- it's just a bad decision. It's, it's, a, it's a, 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 not a priority of the state of Connecticut uh, government at this time, in my opinion. I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here with you just for a minute because I, I understand, you know, the, the illegal immigrants, you know, they're 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 not really i mean they're already breaking the laws of this country by being here and it's a major problem that we should be dealing with and figuring out a solution to but we do a lot of things during times of crisis that maybe may not be politically uh positive but these are people i in who who do need help i mean they're suffering just as much as anybody else right. and as as a as a country the united states has bailed out people in many other countries around the world during difficult times um, so I'm not, I don't know if, if, if this really bothers me as much as many other things, especially because look, it's only about three and a half million dollars and we've spent far more money on far more stupid things. Uh, but you know, th- you know, or two and a half million, whatever this is. Uh, I just think that this is something that, you know, we need to maybe set aside the politics and be a little bit more compassionate. Well, there's a few things going on here. Uh, first and foremost, um, the number one thing I would say is that, I am certainly um, uh, understanding of the plight of people that end up coming to uh, the United States uh, through illegal channels. I say this all the time to people. If I was uh, living in Venezuela or, you know, someplace where there is a lot of, uh, you know, terrible uh, circumstances and it's a dangerous place for me and my family, obviously I'm going to try and make every effort to try and, uh, you know, better my situation. Um, the problem is that we have to have a, a rule of law to, to operate by. And when we are writing policy that encourages uh, bad behavior, I would say that the state of Connecticut has engaged in this over the last 10 years in a big way. We invite illegal immigration into our state um, purposely and, and uh, in, in direct conflict with our national set of federal immigration law. And, you know, that's a problem. You shouldn't be making policies that say, look, come to Connecticut because we're going to give you, uh, you know, tuition discounts to come to Connecticut because we're going to give you a driver's license. Come to Connecticut because we have the easiest social services to obtain if you're an undocumented person. You're inviting these people here and now you've got a problem because you have this population and then we need to take care of. them. So the reason why I wanted to draw attention to this issue is not because I'm not compassionate about those folks. Um, It's about. What are our priorities as a state government? Should we be defying on a regular basis the federal government's rule of law and immigration where they they have they make the rules? Um, it's very clear there's a, a term in government called supremacy. And that is the, in this case, it means that the federal government gets to make laws about immigration, not the state. And the state of Connecticut seems to ignore that. And they're doing it for political purposes. And I don't believe that this particular line item that is happening via an executive order um, is something that legitimately falls under the purview of the governor's abilities uh, and emergency powers is a better term. Um, He's got the right to modify existing law for public health purposes, not create a new quasi public agency for the purpose of taking taxpayer money that is intended for Connecticut citizens who need rental assistance um, and to use it for uh, undocumented people. I mean, I don't disagree with you on, on many of the statements that you just made here. Certainly, uh, I'm, I'm all about understanding incentives and what, what they bring us. Uh, I was in sales uh, for a long enough period of time to understand how you can get what you want out of people and you can incentivize certain behavior by providing 
uh, you know, pluses for the what you want and minuses for what you don't want. Uh, but I, I just and, and and again, I think the state of Connecticut for a long time has had really bad policy allowing sanctuary cities. Um, you know, like you say, giving driver's licenses. I mean, in this uh-huh. this continued push to open up more and more services right. for illegal they're immigrants. They're allowing sanctuary cities, Steve. They're creating sanctuary cities. They are advertising openly policies for the purpose, and it's all for political purpose. It's you know, we're, we're living in a world that is all about identity politics now, um, and this is just another um, you know category that the Democrats seem to want to capture. Is like, look, we are the the people that are on the side of the undocumented population, and look at those mean Republicans, right? Like Rob Sampson, he doesn't like you, and that's just a ridiculous lie. I believe that our policies have to be in keeping with the American system of government, which is that we treat every person as an individual. We don't put them into a category by their race. We don't say the blacks. We don't say the undocumented. We say this individual has equal rights and equal protection under the law like anyone else, and we shouldn't put people into categories. But we do have to be a nation of laws and not of men. Uh, And this is where I, I have a problem with this. Is because we are living under the rule of Ned right now. We are not living under the rule of law. Ned Lamont rolls out of bed each morning, decides what the policy and the laws for the state of Connecticut are going to be, and he makes them uh, based on his own whim and in a completely arbitrary and capricious way, including this. And that's what I was drawing attention to. Not so much whether or not I'm concerned about these individuals. This particular program, by the way, is a quasi-public, which to me is like the worst invention ever. Um, But we can talk about that as a separate issue. A million dollars worth of voluntary charitable money is going into this program. I believe that that is the solution is for uh, people to put their money where their mouth is and uh, find ways to help our fellow citizens, Um, not to redistribute taxpayer money that is intended for one purpose for another because of Ned's will. Yeah, and I, I again, I absolutely agree with you on this because again, it's one of these things where uh, you know you're setting a precedent when it comes to how they're using state money and taxpayer dollars. We've seen this a couple of times already with the Dalio Foundation and the Reopen Connecticut and the hiring of this out of state firm. And and you're you're right, and and it it really is kind of frightening to me to have a governor who is taking full advantage of these opportunities and not being as trans parent as he possibly can with what's happening and where they're spending the money and you know you have an obligation if you want to come to a, to this country and you you want to take advantage of the opportunities in this country and I want everybody and anybody who who is willing to do that to do that but in return you have an obligation to adhere to the laws of this country and it just it really irks me when you see people who are who come to the country illegally have been here for 25 30 years you know, and they say, well, they've been paying taxes. Well, they've been paying, paying sales taxes, but they haven't been paying Social Security taxes right. and they have been paying income taxes. Um, but it irks me with then people th- that they turn around and they go, well, we deserve more. We deserve this. We deserve that. It's like, wait a second. You have an obligation in this agreement, in this arrangement that we have with the citizens in this country that you need to comply with the laws of this country. And if you do... Well, then the government's going to be by your side, hopefully, every time that you are you you need something. But until you right. do live up to your end of the obligation, I just don't get this argument that you know you owe us. Yeah, two things I, I would follow up on that on your comments, Steve. Well, well said. First off, but the quasi public concern, the Dalio. Um, um, uh, partnership that it once existed. The reason why it fell apart is because neither party wanted the, I mean, talking about the state government and the Dalios, they didn't want the transparency and, like, transparency and accountability that is actually required of the government agency that is engaged in trying to improve education, which was their stated goal. Um, and that's a problem. It makes you wonder what they actually were going to do if they didn't want to have the transparency. And that's what leads me to having concerns about this 4CT program, which is $1 million partnership of, of uh, volunteer charitable money and $2.5 million worth of state taxpayer funds. I don't know what the system is going to be, the mechanism to determine who gets this money. How, how do you even manage determining any sort of fair and equitable distribution of funds to people that are not in the country illegally? We don't know um, anything about them. We have no idea what their other sources of income are. Uh, we have no idea 
uh, whether they are truly deserving of the funds. We don't know whether or not the multiple people are going to collect the, 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 the checks. Um, you, you have no idea and there's no accountability there. And I don't know how you create that. Um, the other thing is that the, the press release and even the governor's comments about this program uh, were filled with distortions. Um, there's someone who said at the um, press conference that uh, undocumented uh, immigrants are 3.8 percent of our population, which I don't I don't know if that's true or not, but they're 4.9 percent of our workforce. And it just made me scratch my head because you cannot work lawfully in Connecticut if you were an undocumented alien. So they're 5 percent of our workforce. And if that's actually true, then we have a much larger problem. And what jobs are these that are actually being done underneath under the table with no income tax being paid uh, and displacing at Connecticut citizens uh, at the same time for those jobs? So it's, this is the reason why we have to, even though sometimes it doesn't seem compassionate, the more compassionate thing is to actually have a rule of law that makes sense that everyone ascribes to. You know, it, creating sanctuary cities and creating artificial rules and saying, you know what, we're going to give uh, differential and special treatment to different populations. That, that is completely and utterly dangerous. You know, many of these people are coming from uh, parts of the world where there is lawlessness, where you can't trust the police, that the way out of a, uh, you know, uh, having trouble with the law is to bribe them. You know, we're becoming the same way if we're going to have policies like this. Yeah. And again, I, 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 I am not comfortable with the precedents that are being set here and have been set for the last couple of months with some of the uh, executive orders that the government has put out there it seems that you know as you know you know as well as i do once you set a precedent for something it's very easy the next time something even maybe doesn't meet where we're at right now let's say versus like with the COVID 19 situation if it can be if people can be convinced that it's the same situation well then the same solutions can be put into place Right, completely. I mean, that's one of my grave concerns about everything that has happened is that, uh, you know, I think that the actions that were initially taken were justified based on the um, apparent risk. You know, we were told by uh, the president of the United States and the governor of Connecticut, you know, a Republican and a Democrat leader, uh, the leader of our country and the leader of our state simultaneously, that a couple of million people may die from this. And, of course, people reacted uh, accordingly. Uh, there was a tremendous fear and an immediate reaction to um, comply and, and say, yes, I, we completely agree. We've got to prevent this from happening. And if we've got a shelter in place and we've got to do all of this social distancing, then we absolutely have to. The problem is that that um, did not become a reality. And that was apparent months ago that the uh, ultimate outcome of COVID-19, while still a significant uh, health issue, it, it was nothing compared to that uh, original description. Uh, and yet we have still continued very similar policies. Uh, and I'm anxious to see what happens um, in retrospect, because most other states are wide open. They have no restrictions on restaurants or gyms or anything. And this has been going on for over a month now, and I have not seen anything that would indicate that those situations have led to a spike uh, in more occurrences or more deaths. Um, so Connecticut, we are still on the path of, of, of being overly cautious, in my opinion. Um, I think that in America, and we talked about this the last time, uh, it's not even the government's job to dictate what businesses should be open or not. Uh, we are free citizens in this country. We are not subjects, and the governor does not decide you know, what I get to do each day. Um, he can provide information to me, uh, but I'm going to make my own decision. I'm going to assess my own risk. Um, and that's what freedom is all about. Freedom is not pretty. It's sometimes uh, actually inherently more risky uh, than the alternative. But I will take freedom every opportunity that I can uh, because that's, that's the moral path for human beings is to get to choose our own path in life. I've got a, a professor coming up later in the show who is going to talk about uh, a book that he's released called Cooperation and Coercion, How Busy Bodies Became Busy Bullies and What That Means for Economics and Policies. And one of the things they talk about is, uh, first of all, we shouldn't be enthralled to government solutions and experts because, we, as we've seen, especially over the last few months, experts can be wrong and can be wrong by orders of magnitude. And decisions are being made based on these experts, and we're not supposed to question them. But the other thing that I was going to talk with them about is something that kind of you just alluded to is the, the concept of freedom and how that concept scares so many people, especially elected officials, because they don't seem to like 
the difficult part of ruling over or governing over a free, independent populace. Right. Well, that's because we we live in a in a mixed um, economy and a mixed culture at this point. Um, you know, I wish we lived in a truly free and truly capitalist society as the founders envisioned, but we don't. We don't live in an actual capitalist system. There is all sorts of government intervention. There are loopholes that protect the wealthy. There are uh, tax breaks uh, for uh, you know people that are on the, the lower end of the income scale. And there's all sorts of distortions in between for friends of various politicians of all kinds of levels, corporate welfare and that kind of thing. That's not true capitalism. And we don't have true freedom either uh, because we actually have Slowly but surely, government has been growing at all levels, local, state, and federal, to the point where people's freedoms have been limited, and they've been encouraged to become dependent on the government for things, um, which is terrible. Uh, you know, I heard your earlier segment, and um, a lot of the conversation was about the lack of critical thinking when it comes to reviewing, you know, the soundbite that comes before you and saying, well, is that the whole story? Well, people are losing their ability to think about the whole story. And um, it's unfortunate because most political issues require some depth of thought to actually understand what's going on, other than to say, well, Rob Sampson's against illegal aliens, which is what the left will say about me every time, which is completely false and untrue. I don't put people into those categories. Um, I respect all people equally, but I want us to have a set of laws that applies to everyone no matter what their race or their background or anything, has to apply equally. If it does not, uh, then we have, um, you know, we have chaos. And we're, we're, wit- we're witnessing what's happening when we have uh, laws that are not applied equally um, almost every day in this country with the news that's happening. I've argued uh, this with, with friends of mine so many times in the past that, you know, we've moved away from, like you say, critical thinking and the ability to sort of, uh, learn about a particular topic, you know, in, in schools, there used to be debate clubs where you had to take a side, whether you agreed with it or not, and learn all about that side and actually intelligently debate that side of the argument again, whether you agreed with it or not. And we've removed that from the schools. And now it's all, it seems to be sound bites and headlines. And how many times have you read a headline and then read the story and found out that the story in no way, shape or form supports the headline, uh, the reality, the facts, the quotes that are used, totally undermine the the short little you know blurb or the headline that you see on the twitter uh, uh notification about the story and but it's almost as if they understand and this what they have created here where you know everything is just a soundbite everything is just a blurb and that's what people are going to run with and think they know the whole story but everything is not that simple you know of course it's not and, and, and yeah. again we you know we need to figure out and understand that there are people who have an agenda who are doing this to us. And the only You're way to, right. the only way to fight back is to <laughs> I the keep only, talking over you. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I just well, I keep pausing and making you think I'm done. But uh, the only way we can fight back is to like not let them do that and to actually be more proactive and learning about what's happening. Right. Well, I'll say a couple of quick things. I I think that the news reporting certainly has evolved over time. And my experience, and I was I was surprised by this. Uh, when I first got elected in the way um, the legislature was reported uh, in particular. And that is whenever there is an issue, I don't care what it is, whether it's immigration or the minimum wage or whatever it is, there is absolutely zero, um, you know, fact finding or research done in the reporting. It is simply they walk up to one of the Republicans and say, why are you for or against this issue? Uh, And give me a quote. And then they walk up to the Democrats and do the same. And the only thing that's ever reported is what the Democrats said and what the Republicans said. There is no further thought by the reporter to go and say, well, we actually checked. You know, if one of them is saying two plus two equals four and the other one says two plus two equals five, you would expect the reporter to go back and say, hey, we actually checked. And guess what? Two plus two does equal four. And that's what's lacking. They're just presenting both sides a soundbite arguments with no critical thought and with no review of the facts. And that's extremely dangerous. And it's what's led to our uh, politics becoming extremely tribal. People are not choosing, um, you know, political parties or who they vote for anymore based on ideology. They're doing it based on personality. Um, you know, and this, this 
I don't know when this actually began, but I mean, uh, you know, Clinton had a, had a kind of a cult of personality. Obama definitely did. But Trump has taken that to an, a completely new level. Trump, Trump, people love him or hate him no matter what he does. And if he did exactly the opposite thing that he does every day, the same people would still love him and hate him. And that's how you know it's not based on uh, principles and ideology. And I think that's a tremendous shame. Uh, I judge uh, President Trump the same way I judge Governor Lamont. When they do something right, I will say so. When they do something wrong, I will say so. Um, because we should be measuring our elected officials based on their principles and the policies they're putting forward, forward not just their personality. If I like Trump, so whatever he does is right. It's just the wrong way to look at the world. Well, a friend of mine made a joke yesterday. It'd be interesting to see if Trump like tried to use like reverse psychology and just come out and say the exact opposite of what he really wanted to get done, just to see if people would kind of, you know, push back and then say, "Okay, we'll do it your way," you know. <laughs> but. And, and just to, to kind of wrap this up with you, um, as we're talking about this sort of, you know, you being on the inside of what, what's happening in the legislature and then reading the reporting about it, Michael Crichton, who's, uh, he passed away a number of years ago, but even he pointed this out, I think back in the 80s, and he, he dubbed it the gelman, gelman amnesia effect, where he says, look, you read the newspaper and you see a story on the, front paper, on the front paper that you are intimately knowledgeable about. You know everything, all the ins and outs, everything about this. And as you're reading this, you realize... The reporter has gotten everything in the story wrong, like just completely wrong, because this is your field of expertise. You you can read this and know and, and point out all the, the errors in that story. And then you turn the page to the next page and you'll read another story in the paper and just buy it wholeheartedly because it doesn't fit in. You, you know, you're not you're not an expert on that subject. In other words, you've totally forgotten about the fact that that first reporter just was just got the story completely wrong. But you you completely buy what the next reporter told you. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> it's completely true. Uh, and it's, it's a similar effect to that tribal notion of how we just take certain people. Chris Murphy is a perfect example. I mean, I have watched Chris Murphy, and I, I don't mean to attack him personally. There's a lot of politicians I've witnessed do dishonest things. But, but I actually witnessed this man uh, go through a training on firearms. Um, you know, with someone that I, that I'm uh, directly acquainted with. And I know he was instructed about the difference between a semi-automatic firearm and a fully automatic and everything else. And I watched him go through this uh, with, with an expert and then walk out to the press not seconds later and say exactly the opposite of what he had just been taught. Hmm. To talk about how AR-15s sp- spray bullets and so forth. And it just made me wonder, I mean, what, what kind of person does that? Um, I, I try and take the exact opposite approach. When I discuss any political issue, I always do my best to try and explain all sides of the issue to the listener. I want them to actually understand the points pro and con for what I'm suggesting and what the political opposition is suggesting so that people can make their own mind up. And I do that mostly because I have extreme confidence that I've made the, the, the correct decision based on weighing all that information. And if I transfer that information to them, there's a very high likelihood that they will understand it better, and they are likely to make the same decision I did. Um, and unfortunately, politics is not done that way most of the time. Most of the time, it is trying to pull a fast one over someone by a quick sound bite to say, this is a bad person because of X uh, or whatever, without actually exploring what their position truly is. Senator Sampson, it's been an uh, enjoyable conversation, and uh, it's something that, again, I've been uh, harping on for, for decades about you know uh, not letting others – just you know, manipulate you. Not just falling for whatever you're being told blindly. You've got to you've got to be a skeptic when it comes to this stuff. And uh, so, I want to thank you for your thoughts on this, and thank you for your thoughts on this uh, this program that the governor's putting out there. Because again, while I, I disagree with you that this is maybe not something that we can do to help people out in a very difficult time, but I do agree with you that it does set a really really bad precedent. And it seems to me that. It's never enough because there's already calls to great to rate to uh, spend up to 150 million dollars uh, for undocumented, and that's you know that's that's how this starts. I mean, it's I, I know it's a slippery slope right. argument, but that's how this stuff starts. Well, I believe there are private charitable organizations that would be glad to help, and I think that is the best answer. And in fact, I would be inclined to help organize and raise funds for them because I think it's a far better solution. Senator Rob Sampson, always appreciate your time, sir. Have a great day, and we'll talk again. Thank you, Steve. Take care.